Um, I'm excited um, about how many connections we've already made to this, um, to what I'm going to say. Um, and I'm honored to be asked to speak to you this afternoon about a topic that's very close to my heart um, for many reasons, but m most of all, and maybe first of all, I guess, um, how it impacted my personal life. Um, before I even began the master's program, I knew I wanted to help Christian ministry students be more prepared emotionally and psychologically for the ministry they were called to because my husband Dan had been that student 25 years ago. Um, at the time he entered college, we'd been married several years. Um, the call to ministry was unexpected, but not entirely surprising. Dan excelled in his studies and gained the respect of his professors and fellow students and dreamed of making a difference in the world. Within three and a half years, he graduated with the highest honors while holding down a full-time job and tending to a young family. A few months after graduation, he secured a full-time pastoral position at a growing church in our district. He was probably thought by his professors to be one of the most likely to students to succeed that year. But issues birthed in a dysfunctional family of origin, insecurity, which he kept well hidden, lack of healthy personal relationships, and brewing depression and anxiety proved to be more powerful than all of his academic training, giftedness as a leader and a preacher, or his call. He left the ministry shortly after beginning. Well, now that obviously isn't the end of the story because he's here with me today and he's in ministry um, with lots of growth in between. Um, and I share this snippet from our story to reveal my personal connection with the material. Before beginning my internship, I scheduled a meeting with Dr. David Smith, and we began working with the department to design a program for IWU that would impact all of the ordination track majors. We all decided to require that they take two assessments and complete four individual sessions with a counselor. And I was that counselor for the first four years. Recently, I asked someone in the Center for Student Success at IWU, who currently is there's over kind of the counseling piece, um, to compile a list of the most recent statistics from those sessions with students. From 2010 to spring of 2012, 93 students were seen for individual counseling, and 31 were referred for additional counseling with issues clinically significant enough to warrant concern, one-third. The way the program is currently designed, this does not mean that they followed through with the referral. The, the most common issues which were either self or counselor identified were people-pleasing, lack of appropriate boundaries, inadequate self-care, poor conflict resolution skills, youth, immaturity, inexperience, perfectionism, fear of failure, black and white thinking, relationships issues with other students, ministry personnel and their practicums or professors, sexual confusion, addiction, and misinformation. There were also students who were diagnosed with um, anxiety and depression, eating disorders, OCD, ADHD, trauma and abuse, suicidal ideation, self-harm, and other mental, mental health concerns. Most students identified unresolved family of origin issues, but many were unsure how these issues impacted their present relationships or how they might affect their ministry. Often, students were unwilling to admit family of origin issues as affecting them at all. As I learned more about marriage and family systems therapy, I began to incorporate systems theory into my individual sessions. I also began looking for others who used family systems theory to understand issues pastors face, and I began to find support for my ideas. As I met with students and I talked to them about their family of origin, they frequently connected with the suggestion that they were indeed behaving in current relationships the way they experienced relationship in their own family. 
Livingston et al. designed a program used in multiple seminaries where they focus on the ways in which unconscious patterns from the core relationships in one's childhood get replicated in the interpersonal relationships between a pastor and a congregation. This is a concept which I believe is inescapable when dealing with the challenges we face in ministerial formation. Now, I don't want to say anything from this point on that would give the impression that our first step of providing individual counseling was not helpful. Quite the contrary. I did come to believe, however, that this requirement was not enough. I had proposed early in the design process that group counseling could be used in the pastoral care and counseling practicum. And I believe the groups could increase students' understanding of their own issues, but I also speculated that it could impact them as they learned how to, these issues have been affected by and affect their current and future relationships. As I facilitated multiple groups, the enormity of the systemic issues confronting our students began to unfold. I'll say more about that later, but first I want to share some observations and conclusions about these groups and um, that I and my colleagues presented at Christian Association for Psychological Studies International in 2011. I'm not going to review everything we found, but I want to highlight a few things just to give you some background. First, um, just a list of things we witnessed taking place in students because of the group experience. Personal development and awareness. Getting to know oneself and their function in relationships. Family systems affect on relational church system roles. Parallel process and transference. Also, there was development of various counseling skills, such as listening, open-ended questions, reflecting emotions, silence, attunement, and exploration. Groups offered a laboratory for experiencing community and gaining self-awareness and gaining pastoral counseling skills. Some of the resources our skills our, and skills our students gained in groups were family of origin awareness in multiple areas. They addressed negative parental images. They learned about boundaries and differentiation, triangles, and connection between family of origin and current relationships. They were able to begin identifying their relational and emotional triggers. They also experienced a strong sense of community peer support, and universality, or an awareness that many of their issues were common to others in the group. And they off were offered a safe setting for personal confession. Self and, re self and relational awareness was encouraged, heightening identity development, and teaching personal and relational recognition of internal turmoil. There were also several students who began to attend counseling because of the tendency of group systems to stir up underlying issues. Another thing which happened was um, implicit skill training without explicitly teaching the concepts of pastoral care, like empathy, entering and hearing and attunement to somebody else's story, asking good questions, listening without the opportunity to fix or advise, learning the appropriate times and levels of self-disclosure, being present in someone's story without the opportunity to share their own. You, you, guys, you guys are preachers. You know how hard this was for them. So lots of good stuff. Learning to leave a group each session without tying up loose ends or fixing the messiness. A groups were our first pass at helping students understand themselves and their family system from within a system. And what I witnessed in pastoral care and counseling groups was unparalleled in accomplishing multiple tasks while introducing the students to systems thinking and experience. I believe that if we're to address the emotional and psychological challenges of our students and pastors as a denomination, we must first be convinced that the student's inclination to return to the patterns learned in their family of origin are powerful. Second only to the system who hires them 
the local church. What might we do differently if we began to see this as one of the basic reasons our students and pastors struggle? This would mean not only understanding the power of the family of origin, but the power of other systems our students will encounter as they pursue God's call. I've become convinced we need to undertake some fundamental changes in ministerial formation plan that would move us as a denomination from an individual intervention mindset to a relational systemic process. In other words, to do so, we'll just need to make two very small changes. Are you ready? A change in thinking <laughs> and a change in behavior. <clears throat> Let me move into what I see are some pretty major shifts in how we approach ministerial formation. And I realize that, again, we might become defensive at this point, and if you haven't already. Um, you might say after hearing my ideas that you already think this way, or you're already doing this, or that it isn't necessary to change the current system or that what I'm saying is totally ridiculous and I just don't understand and what it's involved in making these kinds of changes. Please hang with me. Um, I think that most of us would agree that our pastors and students are in trouble. They're struggling and they often give up and we haven't done all we can do to help them. First, as I begin describing more of my thoughts about best practices for training pastors, I would like to lay some basis for understanding systemic thinking. Gary Bartlett, in a paper on systemic modeling, says this, the fundamental assumption on which systemic thinking concept is based is that everything is systemic. In other words, everything interacts with, affects, and is affected by the things around it, everything. If we want different outcomes from a situation, we have to change the system that underpins the situation in such a way that it delivers different outputs. In other words, we have to deal with things systemically because everything is systemic. We can't deal with the parts of a situation in isolation. We have to deal with them in concert we have to deal with both the elements of a situation and how they interact with one another. And so I, I'm switching to talk uh, in this time to benefits of change in our system of ministerial formation, which will in turn introduce a different way of analyzing the problem of emotional or psychological challenges and therefore create an innovative way for developing a solution to that problem for our denomination as a whole. Now, I understand some shifts are taking place. We've talked about some of those shifts, but I think as a whole, still shifts need to be made. First, I want to talk about the importance of addressing a relational component to training. When I was invited to talk about emotional psychological challenges, um, some may and maybe most would expect me to discuss individual issues of specific students or pastors, and I did that to some degree about talking about the program at IWU. And you also might expect that I'd present um, all of the stati statistics I'm sure you've read many times which paint a bleak picture about the state of pastors in our country. Emotional and psychological health appears at first glance to be an individual problem. But as I've already said, it is more than that. I, thi I think we realize it's not that simple. Too often we give in to the temptation in addressing student pastor issues as individual because it seems easier. And it is. But remember, everything is systemic. That means that me treating it as an individual issue doesn't make it an individual issue. It's always more complicated than that. <clears throat> so let me ask you this question. If we were to approach major issues in ministry as relational systemic issues creating psychological emotional reactions like anxiety, depression, addictions, etc., 
How would that change our focus? Thinking and behaving systemically is not without biblical or theological precedent, and I'm way out of my league here, but God himself is a relational system, isn't he? A trinity, the trinity, and has created and instituted multiple systems like creation, the family, the church as a body, cultural systems, us as people, our physical bodies, emotions, our psyche, our spiritual makeup, all our systems. And we need to come understand and come to believe that systems are powerful. And if we're to buy into the, if we're to buy into the need to change our focus. As we already considered, the family origin is probably the most powerful system our students and pastors have ever encountered. It will take self-awareness and a lifetime of work to understand how to change some of the unhealthy patterns passed on to them in their families. Every student we teach, interview, mentor, and hire came from a family system, system which taught them how to behave in relationships implicitly or explicitly. Richardson, in his book, Becoming a Healthier Pastor, says this, if we do not attend to our emotional attachment or family baggage, and many people don't, life will stay much the same for us. We can change marital partners, change churches, move to totally different parts of the world, change or change occupations as a way to change our lives, but these family issues will still be with us running our lives. We will not change. Wherever we go, whoever we're with, whatever we do, our anxiety-based emotional patterns will control how we function. The same issues with family and the emotional system they are part of will continue to affect the quality of our lives, our level of emotional maturity, our level of functioning with others, and perhaps even the length of our lives. This quote gives insight into where I believe we have to start understanding how the student's family of origin will impact their ministry. This has always been true. But as family systems become more and more dysfunctional, a growing number of students are struggling. Compounding the problem for our students and then our pastors are the dysfunctional church systems who hire them who are full of powerful family systems. All of these systems create stress for even the healthiest individuals, but when we add the pressure of ministry, it intensifies any unhealthy emotional patterns of relating. Even more so for the student or pastor who has not yet dealt with the impact of their family of origin. The cycle of insanity is mind-boggling when we focus on the systems involved rather than the individual. But I think it's the only way to truly understand the challenges, and therefore it is the only way to really start forming conclusions about how we move forward and become helpful. The next change in focus I need, think we need to consider is changing from a linear individual plan of formation to a relational systemic process. It's often been our answer in the church to weed out dysfunctional pastors or let them self-eliminate by assuming they must not have been called or they're spiritually immature or they're disobedient, all of which could be true, but it's not that simple, is it? <laughs> what if they are called? Clearly, the Bible lets us peer into the lives of many, many people who were called, but whose personal lives were messy at best, and whose family of origin contributed to the chaos. A linear individual focus of preparation accepts students at one end of the chute, moves them through the steps until they arrive at the other end, an ordained, educated pastor. Um, as you review this diagram, you'll see it's not perfect. And I understand that there's often movement back and forth from one system to another. 
But for the most part, once each system has completed their tasks, the student is moved to the next system until they're done with the process. And the cutoff is particularly drastic at the end of the shoot when the pastor has the church assignment and is ordained. This pattern of preparation fails to operate as if this student came to me or you from a very powerful system, a family of origin, and that they will be assigned to serve in another incredibly powerful system. And all of the systems before and after that assignment have the challenge of ministerial formation and have the power to impact them to be healthier pastors. That's us. Some of the problems with linear thinking and training are it encourages cutoffs, so responsibilities have beginnings and endings. It focuses on my piece of the pie. It creates a lockstep completion method of preparation so we can all check the box and move on. And it encourages outcomes which are measured in the short term. Remember the Bartlett quote, if we want different outcomes from a situation, we have to change the system that underpin, underpins the situation in such a way that it delivers different outputs, healthier pastors. Now my not so complete but different model, which illustrates these changes, is the one you have before you and on the slide. <laughs> Um, Keith brought up several things today about thinking more systemically and, and then we talked about that in other ways and you know the process of um, things becoming more mobile and online it creates all kinds of challenges for this but um, we still, I think we still need to think about it anyway and systemic and relational thinking and formation could take years of restructuring, dreaming, and planning, but would look very different because of many factors. This model isn't completely inclusive, and either I hope, but I hope you'll use it to visualize and visualize it as a three-dimensional model of interaction that underscores cooperation with all of the systems at play in the process. The point isn't a perfect model at this juncture but a visual idea that represents a change in thinking and behavior. Bartlett also said, we can't deal with the parts of a situation in isolation. We have to deal with them in concert. We have to deal with both the elements of a situation and how they interact with one another. Changing our focus would move us from an intervention process with many interventions, move us to an intervention process with many interventions. One that is full of communication, shared vision, purpose, and common concern for the student and later our pastors. I see some of the benefits of systemic training, preparation, and planning as um, being interactive, obviously, encouraging and enjoying shared responsibility. Developing and adopting a plan which is cognizant of all the systems impacting the student, depending on others, and measuring outcomes as long-term and process-oriented. <clears throat> Again, Bartlett reminds us that analysis needs synthesis. Understanding how things behave in isolation is pointless. We have to understand how they behave in concert in order to intervene intelligently. In order for us to work systemically, we have to embrace this last piece as maybe one of the most important things that I'm going to say today. I am, we are all responsible for the emotional, psychological, and relational health of our students. This is fundamental to the solution. Most often, our model of operation has been, at best, to review the individual issues through a few assessments, maybe a few counseling sessions, and possibly a smattering of questions at, during DBMD interviews, although it sounds like some DBMDs are doing much more than that. 
congratulations, and at worst, to ignore emotional and psychological and relational wellness altogether. The question of responsibility has often stifled our progress in designing a workable course of action and has shifted responsibility to the church where the student is assigned or to the district superintendent, and most, but most often to the individual student or pastor. Frequently, our intervention has then become avoidable, unavoidable at a point when we're no longer able to ignore the issues. A shift to a systemic process would emphasize a community and body of Christ model that assumes we are all responsible for the long haul. A few important questions I think we need to ask ourselves concerning responsibility are, if the issues were not resolved prior to my involvement, how and when will they be resolved? And if there is no plan in place to address problems, how will they be resolved and who will be responsible? And if we all accept responsibility at a different level and with a different focus than we have previously, what would that look like? How would a shift to systemic problem solving change the process of formation? Again, changing the focus of responsibility from a short term to an intervention to a long term process would bring a, across the board widespread systemic changes that would impact every system who has formation responsibilities and most of all would op offer the opportunity of change to every student. In fact, I dream about changes that are so widespread they have the ability to impact every pastor and offer them the opportunity to become healthier. If we change the thinking and behavior of the entire system of the Wesleyan Church, no one would be left out. We would begin at first step into the formation process to let anyone know who's called that serving in our denominations means that we are never done caring about your emotional, psychological, and relational health because you are part of a system which commits to you for the long term. Refocusing our ideas about responsibility would also encourage us to become proactive rather than reactive. We must become a denomination that so cares for those who are called to ministry within our churches and schools and districts that we all res accept responsibility for who they are becoming. We have to become pro proactive future thinkers who assume that our students are not emotionally, psychologically, and most of all, relationally ready to enter the ministry. Did you hear that? We have to assume they are not emotionally, psychologically, and most of all, relationally ready to enter the ministry, for the most part. We have to require something different from them, and we have to require something different from ourselves. Imagine what might change in our students and our pastors if they were growing and changing and becoming healthier people because they had a greater understanding of how to navigate and recognizes, recognize the systems impacting their decisions, emotions, and behavior. Imagine what could happen in our churches and in our denomination if we began to behave systemically and to see the world, our denomination, our academic institutions, our churches as powerful some systemic change agents, because they are. Everything is systemic. 